I think that Jesus was telling this priest, a very, sending him a very clear message that I am the offering. I am here. I am going to uh, do this once and for all. And he is the perfect and the final offering for our sin. My name is Kyle, and uh, I'm the campus pastor here in Kalispell. And it's the best job ever. I love it. I'm blessed to have an incredible team to lead this campus with and serve this campus with. And um, it's just really a joy to be with you. Here we are at the, the final Sunday of 2023. And uh, if you were here on January 1st, um, I had the honor of bringing God's word that day too. So it's kind of like bookended with your friendly campus pastor. And uh, it's an honor and a joy really to have some time together with you. And we're just so grateful for, um, man, so much here at this church and what God has done in our own personal lives and uh, the leaders that we have, Pastor John Mark, Pastor Kevin, Pastor Brad, they're amazing and we love them. And of course, our anointed and visionary lead pastors, Pastor Levi and Pastor Jenny, we're so grateful for them and uh, the vision and just, just the example that they are in so many ways. And it's, uh, it's such a privilege to have an opportunity just to share from God's word with, with you. And um, like I said, if you haven't met me before, I'm the campus pastor here. And it's really everything that happens downstairs happens like with my team. And we call ourselves the Diamond Dogs because, well, if you've seen Ted Lasso, you get it. And we got a couple in the room right now. And uh, so I want to welcome you if you're in one of our campuses. Welcome to you, uh, Whitefish, Helena Polson. Congratulations. It's, we, we got each other today. Uh, glad that you're here. Um, also, those of you joining online, welcome. We're so happy that you're here. And also those of you in Deer Lodge, welcome. Glad that you're here. It's going to be a beautiful time in God's word. And we're so for you and uh, thrilled what God's doing. Before we go any further, I want to just pray and welcome God into this space. Uh, Father, we're just so grateful for your word. Thank you for your presence. Lord, I know that there are things in our lives that you seek today to heal, to set us free from, to speak into. And so, Lord, I pray that we would receive your word with that heart, an, a heart that is open to your work, for you to have your will in us and through us. And we know uh, your word never goes out void. It does exactly what it's intended to do. So Father, we just pray today you would work on our lives through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, have you ever experienced something that has like changed your life forever? You know, like something happened, some moment of your life, and it like everything else changed. I can think of a couple that come to mind in my life. Uh, one, meeting my now wife in seventh grade, uh, the coolest. I had felt feelings I had never felt before. Uh, I, I sat right behind her. So those of you in Kalispell, if you know, uh, Linderman Schools, right back over here behind us. Linderman, at the time I went to school in the 1900s, uh, <laughs> they put all the seventh graders from District 5 into one building to just hit puberty on their own, in a safe place at a far distance from everywhere else. And I met my wife, Jessica, right there in seventh grade in Linderman. And I had to sit behind her in homeroom and in first period and second period. We all had the same seats the whole time. It was torture. But we've been married now 18 years. I think we have a picture of her. She's on the right. Um, that's my wife, Jessica. And I love her so much. And she's going to make me choke up. Oh. <clears throat> Also, something that changed my life, the birth of our four children, each unique, each individual life-changing moments. I think we have a picture of them too. So we've got Tyan over there on the left. He's 17 now and a foot taller than the rest of us. We've got Rosalie named after my beautiful grandmother. She's 10. You've got Ivor uh, right there in the middle. He is seven. And Charlotte, who is eight. And they're incredible and a total joy. And I love them so much. Another thing that comes to mind that changed my life was when I first heard the gospel of Jesus and surrendered my life to him. I was a ninth grader. It was September 19th, 1997, in a church in Columbia Falls. And I heard the preacher give the word that I could be saved by faith and that all the things that I had done in my life 
All the debts that I owed, all the sin that I had committed could be washed white as snow. I could be freed, I could be forgiven, and I could be set with a new purpose in my life. And I'm in, I'm in, I'm still in. That day has never changed. I'm in, and every morning I'm in. But it felt like a dry sponge to water. You know what I mean? It was like, when you experience Jesus, true Jesus, there's just nothing at all like him. Amen? Nothing. Um, Another life-changing moment was actually coming to Fresh Life. It was Father's Day 2009. I remember it like it was yesterday. We were at the Strand Theater, and um, the, the music hadn't even played yet. I hadn't heard Pastor Levi anything. I just knew by looking around, I was like, I found my people. And I remember I went up to a, to a person that was serving and I, they had these postcards and they were so glossy. <laughs> they were so nice. And I, I, was, I don't know what I was thinking, but I, and often don't. Um, I was like, did you like have some church make these for you? And the guy's like, no, we designed them in-house. And I was like, these guys are incredible. And so from then on, we've been here, we've given our lives to it. I uh, have had the honor of taking our family and serving God in Billings. We planted a campus there in 2011, and we were there till 2017, and we were called to Portland, Oregon. We served there, led the campus there during all of the good and all of the weird and all of the difficult, and it was a beautiful thing, and we wouldn't wouldn't trade it for the world. And then uh, we moved back here in summer of 2022, and it's been a joy to be leading and serving in the campus that really I, the city I was born in and, you know, all of that's great. One other thing that I can think of in my life that changed me forever was when I got a Traeger. <laughs> now, I think we have a pic. There she is. Look at her, huh? Oh, you can leave that up. It's fine. There she is. We logged a lot of hours together, guys. Yeah, the trigger. See, the thing is, if you know, it's kind of like um, CrossFit. If if you know somebody who has cross or does CrossFit, they're going to tell you everything about it. If you know somebody with a trigger, they're just going to tell you, like, you could smoke anything. You could smoke anything. I, after the 9 a.m. gathering, somebody came up and was like, you actually can smoke an apple pie. He gave me the whole recipe. I'm going to do it for sure. So you can smoke like anything. And we have. We've, like, cooked all sorts of things. Of course, brisket and different sides. And we've done like chicken thighs and all, you name it. We've, we've pretty much done it. Pork belly, pork roast. Uh, we did some pork belly burnt ends at a holiday party not too long ago. They were a smash hit. Uh, we've done prime rib. Uh, never going back to Turkey at Thanksgiving again. Oh, it's so good. So, so good. So anyway, I mean, that's like, we, we just spent a lot of time doing that. And then when we moved to Kalispell, uh, my wife w- saw a flyer for a contest that was uh, called the Brisket Showdown. And she's like, Kyle, you should, you should like enter your brisket into this competition. And we have no business doing such a thing. And of course, it asks for a team name. And it was like the Brisky Boys. We came up with a name. We're the Brisky Boys. And so I got a team. I think we got a picture of them too. Got a whole team and jerseys and everything. The Brisky Boys. Um, you might recognize most of those fellas. Uh, They're here around the campus. And, um, well, we won. (laughs) We won first place with this. We had no idea what we were doing. We were there all day. We just, hey, let's try. So we won. That was cool. A brand was born. A dream was born. It was a beautiful moment. And uh, we took second that year in the sides. We did like a um, like a, like a beet tartare. Yeah, it's a little highbrow for the brisket eating crowd, you know, um, and so the next year, last year, we took third in the brisket, but that's okay. We took first in the sides, and we did an elote corn dish over here. Check that out. Let that happen to you. Look at that. <laughs> Smoked corn with tallow, and then we put it on a black stone, which is a griddle. That's a sermon for a whole nother day. And then those are fresh tomatoes from Mountain, uh, my friend's tomato farm here in town. Um, I shouldn't use his business name. Um, and, uh, and that was delicious. And so now, like, everybody asks us to do these dishes for them. So we've cooked for the staff here at the church with those things. We've cooked for the work team here in Kalispell. Um, that was awesome. We cooked for the house party, which you'll hear about after this. Um, so that was cool. We did, like, a baked potato situation. It was great. Um, we 
even cooked a meal for the varsity men's soccer team at Stillwater Christian School the night before their state finals game, which they won. And obviously, we know why. (laughs) It was the fuel that they had. (laughs) Okay, well, I digress. But the point you, you understand, right? When something changes you, maybe it's a band or a song or Ted Lasso or whatever it is you're enthusiastic about, you're going to share it, you're going to tell everybody you can about it. And that's just what happens when something amazing happens to you. And we're going to spend some time in the book of Mark, and we're going to read about a person who had that literal same transformation of going from one thing to another, and he just couldn't contain himself. So if you could just turn to your Bibles, turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter one. If you don't have a Bible, we're going to put these verses up here on the screen. So don't worry about it. And while you make your way there, I just want to kind of set the groundwork of Mark. Mark is one of three similar gospels. There's four gospels, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And Mark, I kind of think of his work like a skeleton. And the skeleton is really what informed Luke and Matthew. And so they took a lot of notes from this structure. And it's like, if you go into Matthew, you get a a very Jewish application of who Jesus was. And that was the audience that Matthew was written to. And Luke had details. He was a doctor. He had unique details that he saw, but it was from the events that took place in Mark. Mark is most likely written by John Mark. John Mark, we read about in Acts and in Romans, he kind of had a falling out and a restoration uh, with Paul. And uh, we believe that Peter is the one who influenced what we're reading in Mark. So this is like Peter's like anecdotal information, what he saw through the pen of John Mark and most likely written in Rome in about 60 something AD, 65, 67 AD with Paul nearby. So Peter's experience, Mark, John Mark's pen and Paul's presence. John Mark was about 14 years old in the life of Jesus, so he also was there. But you're going to get some pretty intense things when you read the book of Mark. Also, fun fact, it's the shortest gospel, and it just makes so much sense, because if it's Peter's eyewitness and and events that he's telling, well, Peter was an intense dude. He was an intense guy. He was a fisherman. He wasn't around in the birth of Jesus. He sort of is on scene as an adult. And so you don't get like the genealogies, you don't get any of the backstory, the Bethlehem story, any of that like you would in Matthew because Peter wasn't there. He just wasn't around. So it starts with like banger after banger after banger. If there is an ADD disciple, it's Peter, no doubt about it. And that's, I think, why I love him so much. Um, this, This book, Mark, was most likely written to the Romans, And we want to establish who it's written to because it helps us understand the context. If you ever take a verse and you just take it out of thin air and you make a religion out of it, that's being dogmatic and not being very proper and good Bible study. You want to take it in the context that it was written. Though it is something we have access to, it wasn't written to us. It was written to an audience, and in this case, the Romans. And so who the the Romans thought of Jesus informs a lot of what the storytelling is in the book of Mark. The, the Romans, they thought of Jesus like a criminal that, was, that faced justice. He tried to overthrow the Roman government, and he was put to death for it. So that's Jesus in their minds. And so the, the thrust and the narrative of Mark is establishing Jesus as the Messiah, as the one who was wrongly tried for crimes that he didn't commit, and that they could follow him. And so if you can kind of put all that in context, that's how we read scripture. It's just good Bible study. And you know, I have the microphone, so I can talk about it if I want to. All right, hopefully you made it to Mark 1. Um, if not, again, we're going to put the verses up on the screen. I want to read to you, this is Mark 1, verse 40 to verse 45. And it says, And a leper came to him, imploring him and kneeling, said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. But he went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, 
but was out in desolate places, and people were coming to him from every quarter. We're going to go back and actually walk through each of these verses and get a much bigger picture of what is going on. This seems like a fairly innocuous story. Jesus heals a leper. Okay, we're moving on. But there's so much packed into this little passage. I believe that today is going to help shape your understanding of who Jesus is and his position in your life and the things that you face and his willingness to heal you and to touch you and to touch me and to heal me as well. We have a title for this message. It's From Glory for Glory. And we're going to see the glory of God healing uh, the leper. And the purpose then is for him to spread this information and to live this new life sharing with everyone. But first, we have the problem of the man with leprosy. Leprosy was a term that was used for lots of skin-related uh, diseases, and it was, it was a very, very, very bad thing to be, acute, to be given this title that you have leprosy. Leprosy today is known as Hansen's disease. Hansen's disease has, a, has treatment. You can live with it. About 100 Americans per year are diagnosed with it. But at this time, this was a death sentence. If you uh, were given this um, determination, you have leprosy, your whole life is going to change. Uh, you are no longer allowed to live with your family. You are no longer allowed to live in your community. Uh, you can't own anything. You can't buy anything. Uh, you're forced to beg for everything. You have to live outside the walls of the city, tear your clothes, grow your hair over your face. Now, some of you are going to get triggered at this, and you have to stay six feet away from everyone. And you got to yell at the top of your lungs when you see someone coming, unclean, unclean. And that's by law. You are by law required to suffer. And so to imagine this person facing this horrible diagnosis, um, he was in a terrible state and in need of a savior. Every time you hear about leprosy, in scripture. It's also a physical picture of sin. Why? Well, leprosy is a, a, the death of nerves, and it starts in, in fingers and affects the nose. It can affect the forehead, the gums, the teeth, the ears, and, and it grows much like sin. It's a disease that grows and leads only to death. A horrible, lonely, suffering, hopeless death. And that is the severity that unhealed sin is. And so when you see the picture of leprosy, just always picture in your mind also, this is an analogy to sin. If you were given this prognosis, you were not just physically unclean, you were, you were spiritually unclean. You were a complete reject. And so Jesus, Jesus, the high priest, does something that is unbelievable in this moment. See, prior, like Jesus had done some things. He'd cast out some demons. He had healed Peter's mother-in-law, which is a miracle. Um, you know, uh, he taught, he, he did a lot of things, but this is the first like bold, declarative miracle. He was saying by touching this leper that would normally have defiled him, that he has the power over this disease. And he says, I am willing, be clean. And that astonished people. And of course, it's believed that this is one of the things that led to the trial that he faced, that he would blaspheme himself by touching a defiled sinner or a defiled leper, leper in this case. I want to just take a second and highlight the fact that this leper came to him on his knees in this act of humility or desperation. I also think it's interesting. Um, my grandfather, it reminds me of my grandfather. He's a brilliant man. He had his mind till the very last day. In fact, one of the last things my grandfather said, and I think he was about 89 years old, he said, I'm not sure that Albert Einstein was right on the theory of relativity, and I can show you why. That was my grandpa. An intimidating mind. And I remember talking to him. I loved to talk to him about God. He had such a beautiful way of processing things and and he came from a different generation. So you just, you know, it's just awesome. Grandparents are incredible. Um, and I remember talking to him about just like his personal understanding of who God is. And he said, you know, God has bigger things to deal with than my problems. 
And I, I know that that sounds kind of like humble on its own or, or whatever. Like people have bigger problems. They're starving people in Ethiopia, and I get that. But there's no problem in your life that you're struggling with that doesn't matter to God. The small things that we diminish are big things to the Lord. Any sin was worthy of the death of Jesus. He went to the cross for even the smallest thing. And so I just want to speak over you today if, if you're even kind of feeling like, hey, my problems, they, they, you know, hey, Jesus has bigger, bigger fish to fry. That's not true. Today could be the day for you to bring those to Jesus and be healed of. Your addiction, your secrets, the things that you wrestle with, the things that you're not proud of, the things that you face like the leper that is slowly decaying and taking away life from you matter to Jesus and he's willing to stretch out his hand and touch you and heal you and make you clean. I also think that you witness the power of God in verse 41 because he, he was moved with pity. He stretched out his hand. And this compassion and this pity was a powerful move because pity wasn't like a, a celebrated like ideal. You know, it, you didn't show pity. You, there, this was a tough crowd. And so for Jesus, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords with flesh on, has pity, is moved with compassion, some translations say. He, he taught us and has, has changed everything with his compassion. It's Christians that open up orphanages. It's Christians that serve the homeless and the hungry. It's Christians that drill wells in Africa for clean water. It's Christians, why? Because when you're marked with compassion, what do you wanna do? What's your response? To, to extend compassion to someone else. There's even ministries called Compassion Ministries. And so I think that even in a subtle way, you witness the power of his conviction and his compassion. I see myself as this leper, and I hope that today we all picture ourselves to some degree in need of healing. This healing made a personal impact. Uh, If you go down to verse 42, uh, it says, and immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. Say immediately, immediately, right? There wasn't like, hey, in eight weeks, you're going to start to feel better. You're going to grow a knuckle back. You know, that wasn't it. It was immediate. It was immediate, it was permanent, and it was effective. Uh, We're going to read in just a little while what happens in the restoration in the Jewish tradition uh, from somebody that had leprosy, and they're made into a priest. It's beautiful. And that's the healing that is provided by Christ. It's immediate, it's lasting, it's permanent, it's effective. And that will change your life. He also instructed the leper to put it into practice. This is verses 43 and 44. I want to spend some time on these because they're bizarre, easy to sort of glance over. Um, and I honestly, they say when you, when you teach, you're the, the one that learns the most. And I would say that is very true for me. I've never really spent this much time in five verses in, in Mark in my life. And I learned so much in these two verses. So I want to take some time here. It's verse 43 and 44. It uh, says, Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. That was kind of weird to read and I didn't understand it. And I had questions like, why would Jesus not want him to say anything? And, and that's because at the time, Jesus wasn't in his full-blown public ministry yet. He was still retreating to quiet places, prepping and going into cities to preach and to teach. And he was unrecognized. And so this was an early change. And so he, to- he had told some demons previously, don't speak my name, good advice. Um, but also, Um, here, you know, saying, don't tell anyone, but go to the priests and make these offerings that Moses commanded. He's referring to Moses' law found in Leviticus 14. I'm going to read it. Um, Leviticus has two chapters, 13 and 14, all dedicated to just dealing with leprosy. It's massive. And in, in chapter 14, I challenged the, uh, the team, the production team to see if they can keep up. I'm going to read this Hope you brought a big lunch. Buckle up. It's a lot. Um, But I want you to look for a couple of things. Look for the elements that the priest is required to bring and see if you can spot Jesus. Leviticus chapter 14, called cleansing the sin. 
of skin disease. The Lord spoke to Moses. This is the law concerning the person afflicted with a skin disease on the day of his cleansing. He is to be brought to the priest who will go outside the camp and examine him. If the skin disease has disappeared from the afflicted person, the priest will order that two live clean birds, cedar wood, scarlet yarn, and hyssop be brought for the one who's to be cleansed. Then the priest will order that one of the birds be slaughtered over fresh water in a clay pot. He is to take the live bird together with the cedar wood, the scarlet yarn, the hyssop, and dip them all into the blood of the bird that was slaughtered over the fresh water. He will then sprinkle the blood seven times on the one who is to be cleansed from the skin disease. He is to pronounce him clean and release the live bird over the open countryside. The one who is to be cleansed must wash his clothes, shave off all his hair, and bathe with water. He is clean. Afterward, he may enter the camp but he must remain outside his tent for seven days. He is to shave off all of his hair again on the seventh day, his head, his beard, his eyebrows, and the rest of his hair. He is to wash his clothes and bathe himself with water. He is clean. We're halfway. <laughs> on the eighth day, he must take two unblemished male lambs, an unblemished year-old ewe lamb, a grain offering of six quarts of fine flour mixed with olive oil, and one-third of a quart of olive oil. The priest who performs the cleansing will place the person who is to be cleansed together with these offerings before the Lord at the entrance to the tent of meeting. The priest is to take one male lamb and present it as a guilt offering, along with the one-third quart of olive oil, and he will present them as a presentation offering before the Lord. He is to slaughter the male lamb at the place in the sanctuary area where the sin offering and burnt offering are slaughtered. For, the, for like the sin offering, the guilt offering belongs to the priest. It is especially holy. The priest is to take some of the blood from the guilt offering and put it on the lobe of the right ear of the one who is to be cleansed, on the thumb of his right hand, and on the big toe of his right foot. Then the priest will take some of the one-third quart of olive oil and pour it into the, his left palm. The priest will dip his right finger into this oil in his left palm and sprinkle some of the oil with his finger seven times before the Lord. For the oil remaining in his palm, the priest will put some on the lobe of the right ear of the one who is to be cleansed, on the thumb of his right, right hand, and on the big toe of his right foot, on top of the blood of the guilt offering." What is left of the oil in the priest's palm, he is to put on the head of the one who is to be cleansed. In this way, the priest will make atonement for him before the Lord. The priest is to sacrifice the sin offering and make atonement for the one to be cleansed from his uncleanness. Afterward, he will slaughter the burnt offering. The priest is to offer the burnt offering and the grain offering on the altar. The priest will make atonement for him and he will be clean. Whew. That is a whole lot, right? And that's just half of the chapter of 14. He goes on. Um, interesting take here. There are two recorded instances in the Old Testament where a person had leprosy and was healed. The first is Miriam. This is in Numbers 12. She's the wife of Aaron. She contracts leprosy from gossip, so there's your lesson for today. <clears throat> um, and Moses prays to God and says, would you please heal Miriam? And, and he says, put her outside of her tent for seven days and she'll be healed. So not 20 verses of different rites and, and offerings, but just outside of her tent for seven days and she's healed. The second is Naaman, and he's commanded by Elisha to go and dip into the river. And he doesn't want to. And so he doesn't for a while, and he wrestles with leprosy, and he finally relents after some bickering, and he is cleansed in the river. But note that neither one of these people went to the temple and had the priest do this offering for them. So this is the third leprosy uh, story, and the first that we see in Scripture that a priest actually would make these um, offerings. And I think that's pretty wild, that... Jesus tells this man not to say anything, but I think he knows exactly what he's doing. I think he's telling the priest something. What do you think? I think he's telling the priest, I am. I am these things. The parallels are bananas. Check this out. Okay. Uh, the two birds. Makes me think of the Holy Spirit alighting on Jesus' shoulder at his baptism. 
Moreover, these, these birds were dipped into running fresh water, like a baptism. And then they were released into the wilderness, like Jesus, right after his baptism, released into the wilderness. I'm not saying this is fact. I'm just saying it's bizarre and interesting. The priest, he brings a yarn of scarlet. Anybody remember something to do with scarlet? Rahab, my friends, Rahab. There was a rope of scarlet to signify salvation and rescue. He is the scarlet yarn. The priest anoints the head with oil. He didn't just dab the head with oil. Okay, so that's, that's one. But to anoint the head with this remainder of oil was to signify priestly status. What does scripture say? That we are a royal priesthood, a chosen generation. In Christ, you are receiving the offering that he makes and you, your identity is changed into a royal priest. That is God's word. Take it up with him. Wild to me. Okay, how about the blood of the lamb? I mean, we know Jesus is the lamb of God. His blood is the atonement for our sin. And this blood is sprinkled on the head. Reminds me of a crown of thorns. On the earlobe, on the thumb, and on the foot. And it makes me think of a cross or the Passover. I mean, it's a beautiful picture. How about this? The priest was to bring cedar wood. Okay, it's getting out of hand. I Googled it. The cross, most likely was constructed of what kind of wood? I bet you can't guess. Cedar wood. Unbelievable. Cedar wood. Okay, last thing it says that the priest was to bring in hyssop. Hyssop. Where do I see hyssop? Hyssop is what was served to Jesus mixed with wine while he's on the cross, on the, the long stick, and Jesus turned his face away. Hyssop was used as a flavor enhancer and an antiseptic. Hyssop shows up at Jesus' sacrifice as well. Again, these are just sort of like cliff notes on the side going like, this is wild to me and a beautiful picture. And I think that's why he told this man not to say anything. I think he said, hey, I got it from here. I'm gonna tell the priest exactly what's going on because Jesus is the ultimate offering for our sin. If we are the leper, he is the ultimate cover over all of our decay, if you will. Last verse here in this passage is verse 45. And of course, you see this unrestrained passion of this man who is healed. And you can't blame the guy, right? I mean, to essentially go from dead to living, to be healed permanently, perfectly, you can't help the guy, help but have, you know, compassion for him. But he did kind of blabber his mouth a little bit, got a little lippy. Okay, he affected Jesus's ministry, it says here. He went out and began to talk freely about it and spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in desolate places and people were coming to him from every quarter. I do think Jesus knew this would happen. I don't think that Jesus was frustrated, but I do think that it affected his ministry. I do think that it hastened the charges that he faced. I do think that he experienced some type of handicapping to the work that he was gonna do. I do believe that. And I think that that's a beautiful picture to understand that Jesus was willing, if we go back to that verse, he was willing to heal, knowing the implications that it would cost him and his ministry. And that is our Jesus. He is willing. And he was inconvenienced, right? He came to earth and he, he didn't consider it an inconvenience, of course, but his, his whole role on earth was that of humble and a servant to die on a cross for us. And we are that leper for sure. We have this decaying disease called sin and left to our own devices, we cannot heal it. And when it is full grown, it leads to death. And Jesus, when he heals, he spoke aloud from this cedar cross it is finished. He paid the ultimate price once and for all. And on that cross is where we get all of our hope. And when we look to the cross, we receive the, the work that Jesus did in the past for our present and for our past and for our, our future. And so maybe just today while you're listening, maybe something is stirring in your heart that God is illuminating. He wants to heal you from, he wants to touch you with. And I believe that it is truly a matter of surrender. It is just the simple act of saying, I cannot heal myself like this leper on your knees, coming to the Lord and saying, if you're willing, cleanse me. I know God's will. It says in 2 Peter 3, 9, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. Not a few, not a couple, not just 
a campus in Kalispell, but all, and that is the work that Jesus did. It's for one and for all. I had a Bible college teacher named Pete, Pete Volkowski. He was incredible, big brute of an Australian man. Um, I feel the need to tell you that, I don't know why. Um, the theologically, he was a giant. I mean, I was just mesmerized by the wisdom that he had. And he said something that um, I wish he was famous for. I'm trying my best here. We put it on a slide. It says, every encounter a person had with Jesus as recorded in scripture, their world as they knew it came to an end. And you look through scripture. I hope you never forget that saying. And as you read through the, the gospels, you'll see it time and time and time again. Everyone's world comes to an end when you meet Jesus. And it could be for, for better or for worse. I mean, not everybody chose to follow Jesus, but they all heard it. They all had to deal with it. If they're going to continue to live a lie, then they will. But you cannot go on believing this was your reality. No, nonetheless, he saw through it and he spoke into it. And I can tell you and testify to you today that that was my story. September 19th, 1997, that was the day that Jesus entered into my life and I was never the same. My world came to an end. And I'm sure many of you in this room can agree that when you encounter Jesus, your world, as you know it, comes to an end. And that is a beautiful, beautiful thing. I wanna pray with us today uh, before we go, uh, just to close out this message and then we're gonna share in communion. So if you join me in prayer, bow your heads, close your eyes. If today uh, you're hearing from God saying, you are that leper and I want you to come to me and be healed. Today, I wanna give you the opportunity to do that. We're gonna pray a prayer in a, in a moment that I'd love for you to recite with me and our church is gonna recite it together. Those of you online, those of you in our campuses as well. If you're feeling that you are far from God or you've been running from God or he's calling you home today, whether that's returning to him or turning to him for the first time today, I want you to pray this prayer with me and believe it in your heart. Say this, say, Jesus, I know that you are able to heal and I believe you are willing to heal. Please heal me of my sin. Forgive me of my debt. Wash me in your grace and cover me with your love. I receive your gift of salvation today and I will serve you as Lord. Please give me the strength to live for you and to tell of the healing that you've done in me. In Jesus' name.